um, at the base of the screen at any time during the talk. And I will then collate the questions and put them to the speaker at the end of the talk. If you need to contact us about anything else, uh, any technical issues, then please use the chat function and someone will get back to you and try and um, remedy the situation with you. Um, the recording will be available as usual for all attendees after the event, and we will be sharing details about how to access it um, via the email that you shared with us when you registered. So now to tonight's speaker, and I'm delighted to welcome Dr. Mark Spencer, uh, a botanist with a diversity of, of interests ranging from the evolution of water molds to 17th and 18th century botany and forensic botany, um, for which he's pretty well known these days. In his early days, Mark studied horticulture at the Royal Botanic Gardens Kew, um, and then moved on some years later to um, the University of Reading, where he studied botany um, as a mature student um, to degree level, and then stayed on to do a, a PhD in the evolution of, of plant pathogenic fungi. After that, um, he, he was responsible for a big survey of London's wild plants on behalf of the Greater London Authority. Um, and then he spent 12 years working as curator of botany at the Natural History Museum in, in London, which is where I first met him when he showed me the Sloan Herbarium, which contains fine specimens of Oxford ragwort. Um, close to my own heart. Since leaving the museum, he's worked freelance as a consultant bot botanist, specializing in several fields, including botanical surveys, curation and museology, and most famously, um, forensic botany, where he found that, that ob observation of the growth of plants, particularly brambles, can be very informative for estimating the time elapsed since a human body came to rest in woodland or hedgerows, a fact he eloquently explained on Radio 4's The Life Scientific in March 2021. Among his many current projects, he is coordinating a major uh, survey to document the floor of London on behalf of the London Natural History Society. Also in London, he is the BSBI Vice County Plant Recorder for Middlesex and Honorary Botany Curator at the Linnaean Society. Mark's talk for us this evening is intriguingly entitled, It's Not All Love, Peace and Harmony, The Deadly World of Plant-Fungal Interactions. Mark. Please tell us more. Thank you very much for that very generous introduction, Simon. I'm just going to put up my presentation so everybody can see this. I hope you can all see that. Oh, it would help if I actually turned on the share screen, silly me. Oh, naughty. Having a daft moment. Bear with me a moment, folks. I forgot to do share screen. <laughs> there we go, that's better. So you can see what I'm talking about. And I just need to do that. So the first thing I wanted to say is actually that um, when you put together a title for a talk, you're wildly enthused by it and you think, oh, I'm going to talk about this. And then in the case of this lecture, you look at the talk title and you think, oh, I don't quite like that. Um, and I definitely feel that uh, I'm very much for the, the love, peace and harmony element of it, that it's not all love, peace and harmony, but I think I overplayed the deadly element. Um, I think it's important to emphasise that uh, deadliness does come into the relationship between plants and fungi, but it's a much more complex and nuanced tale that I'm going to be presenting to you. 
Um, the next thing I wanted to do was just bring your attention to this spray of ash that I have in front of you on the screen. Um, I'll be returning to ash trees momentarily at the end of my talk and talking about one of the most um, worrying elements of plant fungal interactions and plant diseases and plant health and the role we are playing in disturbing those relationships. And I suspect many of you are familiar with a disease called ash dieback, um, which is going to have very, very severe impacts upon our wild and cultivated ash in this country over the next few decades. But I'll be returning to that a little bit later on. Next thing I wanted to do was to present some um, kind of questions and hopefully some answers for you because people often get confused by fungi or fungi or other ways that you'd like to say them. It doesn't really matter how you say them, but one of the critical things is understanding what you're actually talking about. Um, first thing is that the, the world of fungi is large and complex. Um, and the critical thing is when you're explaining fungi is actually big F means something. So if it's spelled with a capital F or versus with a lower case F. And that is because fungal diversity is enormous and not all fungusy or fungus-like organisms are actually related to each other. So the kingdom fungi, to which I'll be talking about mainly, which are um, the big F fungi, are our, our own closest relatives. Plants and animals, sorry, plants, and sorry, excuse me, I'm sorry, that sentence again, naughty me. Fungi and animals are each other's closest relatives. They are distantly related, fungi are, from plants. Get that sentence in the right order. So, uh, and this is often a surprise to people because botany and mycology have been traditionally treated as sister disciplines and people have thought of in many ways as fungi as being plants or plant-like, um, but they have more in common with us. So, Capital F fungi I'll talk about a little bit more, but there are other fungus-like organisms on the planet, one of which are a group of organisms dear to my heart, which I did my PhD on, which are the oomycetes or water moulds. And oomycetes are not at all related or very, very distantly related to capital F fungi, mushrooms and toadstools and, and moulds that you might um, find on your bread. They are more closely related to the brown seaweeds. Um, so the complexity of fungal diversity is, is great and involves many millions of organisms, but we will largely be concentrating in this talk today upon the uh, core group of fungi. So why are lots of unrelated organisms fungus-like or fungal? with a lowercase f. And the reason for that is it's a very, very successful strategy. Having a capacity to function in an ecosystem and to fit into the jigsaw of life, into the ecology of life, is a very, very important and successful strategy for fungal organisms. One thing they tend to have in common is that they have a, a set of tissue structure, which is usually a mycelium, a thread-like structure, which then grows out into the environment where they want to feed and, um, and attach to the substrate they're interested in. So fungi actually sit rather strangely halfway between plants and animals in the way they function. So if you've got this slide here, this presentation here, this shows you a little bit of actually what this means. So, us animals are what we refer to as phagotrophic. So um, animals are phagotrophs, which means we ingest our food through phagotrophy. We engulf it, um, the process of eating. And that is different to fungi. They, like plants, are osmotrophs, which means they actually absorb nutrients from the outer environment and it passes through cellular membranes. So they don't engulf, they absorb. So they have that in common with plants. 
Conversely, they're quite different to plants in that plants are autotrophs. Plants, principally, vast majority of plants anyway, gain their energy from sunlight. Whereas fungi are like us in that they're heterotrophs. They gain their energy from breaking down complex organic matter into simple inorganic matter. So these relatively challenging sounding terms actually explain some relatively simple concepts is that the fungi ultimately sit somewhat halfway between the two worlds of plants and fungi, despite being evolutionary speaking, as I said earlier on, more closely related to us. And this is a key part about their ecological relationships with two, both of these groups of organisms, that they are on a, we refer to in many cases, as trophic scale or in relationship about actually sharing energy or movement of energy and nutrients. And this is very, very fundamental to our understanding of relationships between plants and fungi because they are fighting for energy. They are fighting for resources, they're fighting for food, and that is actually key to their, their relationship in many respects, which is why I refer to this talk as not all love, peace and harmony. So the big F is the kingdom fungi. This is the taxonomic group, as we like to refer. These are the, the largest group of fungal organisms on the planet. There were probably 10 million or so. Uh, and they are the ones that you're familiar with, the mushrooms, the toadstools, the molds on your slice of bread, the diseases kind of producing various things on the foliage of your fruit trees, et cetera, et cetera, if you're a gardener in most cases. And so I will be largely talking about the kingdom fungi, but I will be coming back to the oomycetes a little bit later on. So next thing I wanted to talk about, which exemplifies actually how plants and fungi interact with each other in this trophic relationship, is actually the idea of symbiosis. And it's fair to say that quite often as not, Many of us, myself included at times, frankly, sometimes misapply the word symbiosis. And symbiosis essentially more widely applies to the to interactions between two species. And they are given, oh, this, this concept has got three main characterizations underneath it. We have mutualism, commensalism, and parasitism. Broadly speaking, a mutualistic relationship, such as this lichen here, which is a relationship between a fungal organism and one or more algae, because we now realize that may, most lichen actually have two different types of algal symbiont in there, is a mutually beneficial arrangement between both organisms. They share food and nutrients. Commensalism is a... Uh, integrate in many respects between mutualism and parasitism and this is a relationship whereby one species gains benefit from the physical contact and relationship with another species when the other species is not necessarily adversely affected or it's rather indefinable in many respects so the example of that as i have down here is this thing here, fistulina, which is the beefsteak fungus, which I will talk about later on. This is a fungus which is sometimes weakly pathogenic, but essentially is neutral to the impact and the well-being of the tree that it's growing on. And I'll talk about that a little bit later on. Then finally, we have parasitic relationships. These are ones where we can clearly identify that an organism is growing on another organism or is benefiting nutritionally from another organism to the detriment to better or worse the, the the thing that it is host is feeding off and the example of this down here is a little rust fungus here called fragmidium violaceum fragmidium violaceum is a very common rust fungus that you find on brambles um, people will see it all the time as they walk through the woodlands in autumn, but will often not notice it. But it's a very, very common rust on many of our brambles in our landscape. 
Now, I believe probably many of you have been listening to other parts of this lecture series through the autumn and the idea of the Wood Wide Web, I believe, has come forward and been presented. And no doubt you have heard of this term potentially in other pieces of kind of um, the media uh, globally. It is a now a very, very popular idea based upon scientific studies which have shown the interdependence and the nutrition sharing of fungal organisms with a wide range of plants, particularly trees, um, hence woodland, wood wide web. Now, I'm not going to talk about this relationship much because it is a clear example of mutualism, the positive, not the, uh, the, the deadly or the negative, so to speak, but it is a very, very important relationship. Because one of the things about mutualism, commensalism and parasitism is that they are a sliding scale of relationships. It is sometimes not very clear how to draw boundaries between some of these. And some things are not necessarily always mutualistic and some things are not always necessarily purely commensalism. But these wood wide web fungal organisms are some of the most charismatic and um, interesting woodland fungi that we find, but they are not purely restricted to it. They are essentially broken up into two main groups of mycorrhizae. And the mycorrhizae is where the fungal mycelium, the threads, are wrapped around and to varying degrees penetrating the root structure of the tree. And it is at that point where the interchange of sunlight energy from the trees or other plants goes into the mycelium, chemical energy and nutrients from the soil from the fungus goes into the tree for other forms of plants. So they are called mycorrhizal associations and they come in two main forms, endomycorrhizae and ectomycorrhizae. And they're just about the varying degrees of root penetration by the, by the fungi and the actual structures that are formed within there. And these two russular specimens that I have here, these here are classic examples of ectomycorrhizal fungi that are very, very important in the of our woodlands. Excuse me, not yes, ecto. I never always get my ectos and endos mixed up, not to me. But I'm going to move past mycorrhizal fungi, more or less, bar one or two comments. Now, as I said, not only are these, these mutualistic relationships often go into a more potentially commensal relationship, but they also sometimes are very, very specialised. Some of these mycorrhizal fungi have very, very specific host relationships. So there's a whole suite of these russula, some of our most beautiful um, fungi, that are restricted purely to one or two tree species or a certain type of willow and nothing else. So there's a very, very strong independence between the two individual species. Other mycorrhizal associations are more diverse. Certain fungi can associate with quite a wide range of trees and also certain tree species, such as these two charismatic trees in front of you here, can actually associate with a very, very diverse range of fungi. And this actually is ultimately quite key to a very, very significant risk, because as I say, Mycorrhizae is not always wonderful and fantastic. There are challenges at times. And this is one of the more interesting of these challenges because this fabulous mushroom in front of us is the Amanita muscaria, one of the world's most, if not the world's most famous fungus, it's one of the most easily recognizable and culturally significant for many of us. Now, this is a fungus which is a northern hemisphere fungus. It is found right through a wide range of the boreal forests of the northern hemisphere, strongly associated with silver birch, pine and some other species. And it is a very, very significant benefit in those ecosystems because of this mutualistic relationship. Now, this is a species that was partially accidentally and partially purposefully introduced into New Zealand 
um, over the last hundred years or so, because in the New Zealand has a very, very important forestry industry, which is driven by the production of pine. And so this is a very, very important part initially of actually helping pine trees establish in soils in New Zealand. All well and good. However, over the last couple of decades or so, the New Zealand ecologists have started to see some very, very worrying signs, which is this species, which is quite wide in its host range in the northern hemisphere, has stepped out of or spored out of the, um, the plantation systems of New Zealand and has started to colonise the indigenous forest ecosystems of New Zealand. Now, these ecosystems have been isolated um, from other forest systems for 30, 40 million years. The trees are, in many cases, very, very evolutionarily distinct. And they also have their own unique relationships with fungi and other organisms. For reasons that are still being worked through, basically, some of the tree species in these ecosystems, when met with this new mycorrhizal fungus, have um, basically formed new associations between it and them. This has had a really, really severe cascade effect in some forests because this fungus is now beginning to outcompete the native mycorrhizal fungi and is making them less common and potentially ultimately maybe at risk of extinction in some cases. But the secondary and tertiary effects are really, really quite fascinating and appalling as well, because many of those native and indigenous fungi supported unique indigenous fly and beetle diversity. And those invertebrates have not adapted to living on Amanita muscaria. So their populations in some of these forests are declining and falling. And the tertiary impact of this is that in those, in those forests where this is happening, the New Zealand bat species, which feeds on these, and some of the New Zealand bird species are also struggling because of loss of food availability. So some very, very subtle interactions on what would apparently initially seem to be a nice, beneficial, cosy relationship in the wood wide web can actually have some very, very severe consequences. Now, the other thing about the wood wide web is that uh, we focus, and I've mentioned trees time and time again, on this relationship of trees and fungi, and it's something that's very much picked up in um, one popular culture. But in fact, the vast majority of flowering plants, some 95% or so, have these relationships. You can find them in plants in your flower bed, in annuals growing on the street, and in plants in the deserts, cacti, succulents, all sorts of things which are not trees. A relatively small group of flowering plants are not mycorrhizal. And they include members of the protea family, as I've got up here, the amaranths, which actually includes uh, things like um, brains gone black all of a sudden, um, fat hen, and the carnation family, caryophyllaceae, and here in this image here, the brassicaceae, the cabbage family. These are a kind of small cohort of actually overall unrelated plants, apart from amaranths and caryophs, which are quite closely related, that have essentially divested themselves of this mycorrhizal association. We don't really know why, what benefits are, there's quite a bit of work going on to unpick some of this, um, but it is rather unusual. Now I'm going to step away from mycorrhizae and talk about the, the meat of my topic, which is the relationship between plants and fungi are not necessarily on the positive side. This fungus here is probably the most well-known, charismatic, beautiful and fantastic plant and fungus, naughty me, that you'll find growing in your hedgerow, in your garden, and is often a great concern to horticulturists. This is honey fungus, Armillaria melia, which is well known in horticultural circles for being a very, very significant killer of trees. 
Now, it is more complicated than that because Armillaria melia is a classic example of a fungal organism which can move outside of this, uh, this relationship of symbiosis, out of being a parasite into saprotrophy. That is using already dead material in the environment and getting the nutrients from that. So this is a fungus which is a facultative parasite. It can live in the environment as a pathogen, killing your plant, or it can sit quite sedately, minding its own business, probably for we don't know how long in some cases, in the environment, sometimes in pieces of deadwood, often suffers is already killed, or in these structures here, these are rhizomorphs, these are aggregations of this mycelial thread. So this is a highly adaptable fungus that can actually survive in soils where there's not large levels of nutrients available immediately and wait until the right host comes along. But also the relationship is more complicated than that. And this is a critical element of actually where we are in our society in the future is because in many cases, facultative pathogens such as our malaria respond to environmental stress. So if there is a potential host growing in a hedgerow, um, such, a, um, such as a dog rose or things like that, and rose family often get hit with those hawthorns, for example, and cherries, which are all known as the rose family. If they are physiologically healthy, they're not heat stress, they're not water stress, they're not having other problems, like bad management being pruned too heavily, for example, they are much, much less likely to be impacted by our malaria. So in the world of climate change and environmental stress, plants as they become more physiologically stressed by the environment are more likely to be attacked by pathogens such as our malaria. So I'm gonna run through a little suite of some of the more charismatic and um, sort of tree killers and plant tree killers that you might find um, in the British landscape. This is a wonderful thing called the giant poly polypore meripilus. Um, it is a, um, has a great fondness for beech trees. It's a very frequent pathogen of beech trees. Again, like our malaria, this is a pathogen which will live in the soil and alongside in the root systems, the wood of beech, and it's a combination of environmental stress, heat stress, and other things that may well, as long with the pathogen interacting with it, will finally kill the tree. Now, Meripilus is one of the relatively few fungi that when you hear a gardener say, I have this growing on a beech tree or I've got it growing on a tree, that I would say you really, really need to very rapidly have some tree surgeons in to give you some advice. Because quite a lot of wood decay and pathogenic tree fungi, fungal organisms, don't necessarily stress the structure of the tree. They don't necessarily make them more vulnerable. The Meripilus is a representative of a small cohort of fungi which tend to attack that junction between the main root structure and the base of the trunks. And this can make the trees very, very, very vulnerable to collapse. So Meripilus is definitely one of these pathogenic tree fungi that you would probably want to get some advice about whether you need to manage the decline of the tree. Other very familiar ones that we find in our landscape are bracket fungi such as this Ganoderma. Now the Meripilus is quite amazing. That huge, they can sometimes be a meter and a half or so across, that fruiting body is actually produced in a matter of weeks or months. It's a very fast growing annual bracket. Whereas the brackets of Ganoderma can last for many, many years. In fact, you can estimate an age by looking at the growth rings patterns in, in, the, in the brackets. If you cut through them, you can get a reasonable estimate of age of the bracket. Now, Ganoderma is a very, very important tree pathogen, but again, it tends to actually develop slowly, grow slowly, and in many cases, it will take a very, very long time, sometimes several decades before the tree finally dies. And this is one of the things about the relationship between parasitism and hosts. It's not a clear cut dead or alive. 
it's a push me pull you fight back and forth relationship between the two organisms which in many cases as i say with this can take a very long time another very frequent um, pathogen that affects tree and pine trees is this delightful thing with a fantastic name of Theolus schweinitzii and this, like Meripilus, does have a tendency to affect the, the lower part of the tree trunk and can also cause tree collapse. So it is one that on occasion you do have to be careful with. And lastly, in this little group, I, I'm going to talk about probably my favourite British fungus, because this delightful thing is Podocypher multizonata. And this too is also a, it's a parasite. But unlike these other species that I'm talking about, it is, even if the tree is unwell, it is a very, very weak parasite. It probably takes many, many decades for the fungus to get up enough um, energy from its relationship from the tree roots to actually produce a fruiting body. And in Podocypher has never been known, as far as I'm aware, to actually cause the death of a tree. It just sort of sits there a bit like a rather nasty boil or a rather glamorous boil in this case on growing the tree roots. It is evolutionarily also very, very interesting because Podocypher is a largely tropical New World group of fungi. This is the only one that gets out of the Americas and the tropics and is found in Western Europe and rather extraordinarily the London area and the New Forest and a few one or two other parts of southern Britain is probably the world stronghold for this really, really fantastic thing. It's sometimes mistaken for another fungus called Griffola. So this is a specialist weekly parasitic fungi which is often associated with ancient old landscape. So another thing about these, these pathogenic fungi is that they often give you an indication of habitat richness and ancientness. You won't find Podocypher growing on a tree in a new build in a housing estate on the outskirts of any town in Southern Britain. This needs ancient landscape to survive. In fact, you can go back to an individual tree each year and pay your respects to these each time they come out of the ground. Wonderful, wonderful thing. Now I'm going to talk a little bit about how um, fungi in trees, these, these decay fungi, have break up into two main cohorts. Um, there, there are more gradations in this, but I'm going to stick with the simplicity of this. They are the white and the brown rotters. And wood is principally made up of two components, cellulose and lignin. Um, cellulose gives it a degree of elasticity and it's important when the tissue is still alive. Lignin is the real hard structure and cellulose binds that. Now, brown rot fungi essentially break down cellulose to get chemical energy and survive and white rot fungi break down lignin. So with brown rot, you take away the cellulose and you're left with the lignin, the hard stuff. White rot, it's the other way around, takes out the lignin and you're left with the soft white cellulose. So you can often look at a decaying piece of wood lying on the ground and if it's all white and spongy, you've got a white rotter. And conversely, if it's hard and blocky, a dark browny red, you've got a brown rotter. Um, white rotters are quite species rich and diverse. Um, this is one of the more glamorous ones. This is Seriporius, used to be Polyporus squamosus, the dryad saddle. And this again is another species, if the tree is stressed or ill, can go from being relatively weakly pathogenic to saprotrophic to actually being more of an address aggressive killer. So this is a very widespread and large bracket fungus on trees. This is probably the most fascinating and important of the brown rot fungi in certain respects in our environment. This is Fistulina hepatica, the beefsteak fungus. Mm. And Fistulina is extraordinary because it's the only member of its genus in the whole world. So it's, um, it's a monotypic genus, or monospecific genus rather, apologies, um, with a very unusual form. It does feel like a slab of dead meat. 
Um, and it has this incredibly important function in veteran landscapes and veteran oak trees, because this is a very important example of a fungus doing, despite it being a pathogen or a weak pathogen, it does something very important. Because this fungus actually specializes in eating the cellulose components, hence its brown rotter, of the inside of an oak tree. Now that has a very, very important consequence for the well-being of the tree, and it's positive, because fistulina basically causes old oak trees to become hollow, not solid cylinders. That makes those trees much more resistant to wind throw and damage from wind compression from the side, because cylinders are stronger from a physics energy point of view than a solid structure. So not only do these trees become structurally more sound, but also they then become very, very important ecosystems for a wide range of other fungal organisms that live inside in the hollowed space, and also a very, very wide range of important invertebrates. In fact, actually, our veteran oaks of places such as Richmond Park in London, Sherwood Forest further north and other ancient pieces of landscape are some of the most important environments in Western Europe for veteran trees such as this and the associated biodiversity they have. Oh. So you have a gradation from these tree killers that may or may not be strongly pathogenic to weakly pathogenic, integrating into purely saprotrophic organisms which are purely breaking down already dead nutrition mm -hmm. such as this very beautiful Tramites versicola which is a very very common wood decay fungus in woodlands and other things such as these little ink caps. Now I'm going to move on away from uh, the roots and talk about the leaves and the branches and coming up and I'm going to talk about a area of the plant called the filler plane, which is the environment of the leaf surface and the interaction between the leaf um, and actual organisms that live on there. There will be bacteria, fungi, many of which will be doing absolutely nothing at all. In many cases, there are many fungal organisms that live on the leaf surface that are probably very, very important for plant well-being. They will be um, killing and eating bacteria and viruses and processing them. But again, this relationship is part of a continuum. And this is one of the most familiar, weakly, moderately parasitic um, fungi that you will find in our woodlands. This is Rytisma acerinum, the tar spot growing on maple. Oh, sorry, on sycamore, apologies. Uh, and this is a very, very important fungus which will grow on the leaf when it's alive through the summer, but relatively low levels. It will only really start to successfully or rapidly grow as the leaf approaches autumn. And what happens there is that the leaf, as it approaches normal, as temperatures drop, light levels decline, is the leaf will start to auto break down. The plant programs the leaf to basically break down and collapse. It, redraw, it withdraws back into the plant essential nutrients, certain elements that are very important, and it leaves behind sugary compounds which are cheap and cheerful in terms of the plant's energy and physiology. And this little rytisma will then kick into action and start actually mopping up those nutrients and then be able to produce its fruiting bodies, which is the black blobs of tar you can see on the surface. So rytisma is a sort of quite sedate, weak, mild, pathogen slash inhabitant of your sycamore leaf. But there are a very, very important group of very, very specialist, specialist and pathogens that live on foliage, and particularly the rusts. They have extraordinarily complex biology and they often have very, very specific host pathogen relationships. This is one of the most important economically. This is Puccinia graminis. And Puccinia graminis has, like many other of, the, of these rusts, has two hosts. It has grain crops such as wheat as one host, and the alternate host, because it has this complex life history, is Berberis. 
Berberis vulgaris. Now, this relationship was identified very early on, and as a consequence, Berberis in the wild became an extremely rare plant because farmers targeted it and removed it from the landscape because they were, in fact, if they took that part of the life cycle away, the rust was less likely to infect their crops. So this is rust which has now become much less common, certainly on Berberis than it used to be in large parts of Western Europe. But these complex and sophisticated pa pathogenic relationships between rusts and plants, we can use to our advantage. So I've been working on and off over the last 10 years or so with a couple of government level projects looking at biocontrol agents for various invasive plant species in this country. This is one of the most successful and familiar. This is Himalayan balsam in Patians glandulifera. Now, Impatiens glandulifera is one of our most severe and serious invasive species, causing very, very significant negative impacts upon our habitat. And a group of researchers um, and, and partner organisations based from Cabi International um, down in Egham in Surrey visited the Himalayas to find a specific strain of Puccinia comorovii pathovar glandulifera. That basically tells that this particular form of Puccinia is so host specific, it will only do well and thrive on Himalayan balsam. You can present it with other related um, impatiens, such as the busy lizzy, because this is a relative of busy lizzy, and it won't grow on them. So Puccinia comorovia glandulifrae is considered a quite robust and viable biocontrol agent and is now being released and has been for a few years in various parts of Britain and Ireland with the hope that it will establish and reduce the abundance of this population of this invasive species. Now, sophisticated parasites in ones that have got very highly evolved relationships, such as this Puccinia, very, very rarely kill their host entirely because that is not evolutionarily going to work to their advantage. It doesn't make sense from an evolutionary perspective. What will happen is that it will reduce the abundance, we hope, of this invasive species in our landscape. Similarly, um, this group of uh, rusts and smuts, smuts and their allied organisms can do extraordinary things to the six lives of plants. So this is anthosmut, Microbotrium violaceum, and anthosmut um, can affect um, the female parts and the female flowers of plants such as white campion, and it can induce the formation of male reproductive organs. And actually, those male reproductive organs, when they split open instead of producing pollen, will produce vast amounts of dark brown, blackish, violetish um, fungal spores in there. So the, the fungus co-ops the sex life of the plant to actually do its own bidding. Now, oh, I've got a lot more time. I'm going to be able to be speed up and not bit. I've got overexcited, naughty me. I'm now going to talk about plants getting their own back momentarily. So plants do actually fight back in all sorts of ways. There are many subtle ways that they do that. I'm going to talk about some of the more exciting and wonderful. And these are a group of plants that are from diverse evolutionary lineages, lineages that we now call mycoheterotrophs. <clears throat> these are plants that generally do not have any photosynthetic capacity. Um, we used to think they were saprotrophs, they just fed purely off dead material in the environment. We now, through various strains of evidence, that these plants actually parasitize fungi such as things like Russula and these other woodland fungi in the environment and take nutrients from them. So they have reversed the scenario and are actually getting the nutrients from the fungi. Here we have two extraordinary uh, representatives of a genus called Thysmia from the Burmaniaceae. This is a largely tropical family. And as the case with many of these little um, microheterotrophs, they have virtually no leaves, they're reduced to scales and these exceedingly odd flowers. Um, very, very amazing group of plants. And this adaptation has evolved repeatedly in unrelated lineages of plants. So Burmania is more closely related to the 
yams, if my memory serves me well. Um, this little thing here, Geosiris, is this strange little twiggy thing in the middle here. So you can see the leaves are, is actually a relative of Iris and Cicerinchium and this Aristea here. So again, it has reduced down its foliage. It doesn't need any more and is parasitizing of fungi. Orchids have got in on the game as well. In fact, orchids are quite famous for this relation. There are quite a wide range of orchid genera have taken up this adaptive strategy. And we have uh, three well-known ones in Britain and Ireland. We have coral root here on the left. We have the bird's nest in the middle and the exceedingly rare Epipogiuma filum on the right. Another characteristic of many of these plants, as well as not having foliage that's of any size, little tiny scales, they often have these fat club-like coralloid root systems. And the point of that is to increase the surface area and the interaction between the plant and the fungi that it's interacting with. And other unrelated groups, plant. this thing here, would you believe it is a relative of the heather. This is another mycoheterotroph, Monotropa hypopitis. And these parasitize a certain type of fungi called tricholoma. They're one of some of the mushrooms that you find in woodlands. And one, one or two species in particular, which are often associated with hazels. So if the first few hundred years of us studying these plants, we thought because they were associated with hazel, that they were in fact had an intimate relationship with the hazel. They don't. They have an intimate relationship with the tricholoma. But the tricholoma has an intimate relationship with the hazel. So you've got this extraordinary continuum of relationships between the organisms. Now I'm going to head into the last section of my talk and return to my PhD topic and a group of organisms which I find absolutely fascinating. And these are the Uomycetes, or if you wish to call them, the Peronosporomycetes is their alternative scientific name. And these are a group of fungal organisms, but they're not fungi with a capital F. Um, and you may recall from the start of this talk, I mentioned how these are more closely related to seaweeds, brown seaweeds in particular. This group of organisms through the foolishness, the cruelty and the politics of the British Empire um, resulted in one of the most catastrophic human events of Northern Europe, which is the infamous famine in Ireland, the causal agent of which is late blight phytophthora infestans. And this is a continuum of behaviour traits where human beings are failing to learn from past mistakes. We are seeing it pan out in New Zealand at the moment in form of a new Phytophthora species has invaded the Kauri forests of northern New Zealand. And this pathogen is now starting to wipe out some of the last remaining and unlogged veteran cowry trees of north part, northern part of the Northern Ireland. These are some of the last remaining extraordinary culturally important trees for the Maori of New Zealand and they are gradually dying because we have allowed through lack of knowledge initially but increasingly poor biosecurity to allowing this fungal, this fungal pathogen to invade New Zealand. And this is a story we have repeated over and over again over the last 200 years. We should have learned around 1910, 1920 with this catastrophic event. Castanea dentata, the American chestnut, used to be about the most significant single species of tree in parts of um, eastern United States and southern Canada. Um, we allowed at the time through naivety the introduction of a thing called siphonectria. Parasitica, which originates from Asia, and Siphonetria caused the death of around, I think they believe, a billion trees of um, American chestnut and changed the landscape forever. Um, and so this is about an asymmetry in the relationship, partly asymmetry caused through us, us moving biota out of the landscape, a landscape. But the other thing is about this is the Siphonetria originally evolved in Asia in association with Asian species of Castanea, with Asian species 
of Luke Chestnut. So they had gone through that war, that Cold War kind of period of adapting to each other's existence over hundreds of thousands, possibly even millions of years of evolution. However, the North American population had not experienced parasitica and so was very, very vulnerable to it. This resulted in this catastrophic loss of this very, very important tree. We are going through exactly the same process in this country now and in other parts of Northern Europe through ash dieback, which I mentioned early on, which is another example of an Asian fungal organism, fungus rather, being introduced into Europe. In this case, we should have known better because there's lots of best practice around biocontrol that we should have taken note of as various societies. Which leads me on to my last and gloomiest point. We are facing one of the most important phases of our history and the world's history. And as we put more stress on our environment, the greater the stresses will become on the relationships between plants and fungi. We will see, I fear, many other scientists fear, more of these very significant disease outbreaks. Thank you. I shall stop sharing my screen now. Thank you very much, um, Mark. That was a, a great tour through the the kingdom of, of, of fungi and, and all the many complex interactions, some good, some bad, some commensal that um, they have with, with, with plants. Um, so, so thank you for that. And there are quite a few uh, questions coming in, which is always welcome. Um, I'll start off. There was a comment that came in very very early on from, from Ziggy saying, wow, beautiful. So um, thank you for that comment, Ziggy. Um, thank you. Was it me <laughs> or the fun guy? <laughs> well, she, she, she wasn't very specific. <laughs> um, I'll take it. <laughs> yes. Okay. Um, there's, there's one here. Um, um, I have seen bracket fungus that seems to be as hard as the tree itself. Um, what causes this? So as a general rule, if you're confronted with a very, very hard bracket that you really have to mm. fist bump, it is a perennial bracket. If you've got a very strong, if it's a very tough one, it is a bracket which will have grown over months or years. Um, and the, the pure and simple reason for that is the bracket needs structural physical integrity to get larger because it gets more and more weight as it gets bigger and bigger. Some of the really big brackets have been known to be a meter and a half, two meters across. In fact, there's records of enormous ones um, it's somewhere in China, I think, in Yunnan. Mm. But it's not uncommon for these brackets to weigh quite a few kilos and be structurally very large. So they need that rigidity to hold them together. And also it's actually about surviving through a winter. If you're a soft, fleshy tissue, in a frost prone environment, you're going to burst, you're going to rupture, you're going to fall apart. Having that kind of robust structure pretend, protect, protects that fruiting body into the next year or decade. Some of these brackets probably live several decades under the right conditions. And, and they're all full of chitin, aren't they? So, so the, yeah. the hardness of what, what, what protects a, an insect exoskeleton um, Thank you for reminding me of that, which is a very strong indicator of the relationship between animals and fungi. Yeah. We are each other's closest relatives. I'd forgotten the, the chitin thing. Thank you, Simon. Yes. Um, here's another one. Oh, this is this is this is a good one for our uh, younger, uh, relatively younger people who are thinking about careers. In your opinion, what areas are in greatest need of research? brackets thinking ahead to potential topics for my phd my um, gosh great question cassie oh it's a hint what sort of rough area is cassie interested in do you know she doesn't, doesn't specify but she's obviously interested in fungi um i would say one of the pressing questions is how fungi plant interactions are going to be impacted by climate change mm. 
but it's fair to say many, many elements of what we are, uh, are still poorly understood. The wood wide web has gained a lot of pop popular kind of enthusiasm and cultural cachet, so to speak. But it's fair to say that those those mutualistic relationships between plants and fungi are still very poorly understood and only in relatively few model systems, certain types of forest in the northern hemisphere. Um, one of the things I always remember, I really love is actually if you go to a chalk grassland in England in August, September, you will see an extraordinary and unique relationship between a type of Amanita, one of the deaf cat relatives, and rock rose. Rock roses and their relatives have incredibly unusual, weird mycorrhizal associations, which are certainly pretty poorly understood. So, and that and grasslands. Grasslands are such important habitats mm -hmm. that are overlooked. The mycorrhizal and another group I didn't mention, the endophytes, things which live in the living tissue um, of leaves and stems, etc., are very, very poorly understood relationships. Gosh, that's, that's that's very interesting. What what is the species of of, of Amanita? Oh my gosh, it's gone out of my head. There are, but there's a whole cohort of really extraordinary. Oh. There's some unique rustulas as well that only live oh. all virtually entirely with uh, with rock roses. Rock rose family is really odd because it has similar, greater diversity as you imagine these associations in the med where yeah. the is it's large. Yeah, there's some really cool things living. Yeah, and it's system. it's the it's the main host for um brown argus butterfly, which is moving north because of climate change. Yeah. Which I think is a massive risk for yeah. the brown argus because rock rose is not moving north because no, it cannot it's, move. It's a no, very, very slow moving species. Yeah. It, it, all these subtle interactions it, it's amazing. Um there was a question that has disappeared that I was um that 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 was something similar to what I was going to ask because I hadn't heard about this um this introduction of fly agarics to New Zealand yeah um and and this the, the, this question comes from a, another student I think I'm hoping to do my dissertation on ecological interactions between fungi and animals I had not heard about the invasive fly agarics in New Zealand and their impacts. Would you mind posting a link? Oh, uh, I'll have to, uh, you should, if you Google, you should get it yeah. fairly quick. If you don't, let me know. And if I, I can't even remember it off the top of my head, but I think there are a couple of papers. Yeah, but, but that, that I thought there was going to be a question there about because uh, I was thinking about that. I hadn't I hadn't come across that. Um, I was actually going to say a small rant on this area, if I may, is I'm, yeah. I'm very, I have a degree of concern about the current popularity of mycorrhizae being used in horticulture and forestry, because what we are tending to do is using um, fungal lineages, which are relatively amenable to culture, culture mm -hmm. because you have to bulk them up first yeah. before you merge. That means, in essence, in many ways, they are adaptable, potentially quite weedy and could well be quite aggressive. And I think we're not putting any real research potential into actually looking at the impacts of these selected lineages being put in, back into the wild. No, that's that's a good point. And that was sort of touched on by last week's speaker, Jill Cowell, who was questioning the um the efficacy of of these micro these commercial mycorrhizae that are uh, that companies are encouraging gardeners to put in with their their plantings and um yeah so it's it's not all wonderful no but but going back to the new zealand thing i mean this is a tricky question but what 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 could potentially be done about mm -hmm. about the, the 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 amanita threat in new zealand because that's that's quite frightening and also what you said about the phytophthora with the cowrie trees yeah. i mean it 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 such a sensitive place that's been isolated for all those millions of years and we, we've seen what happens when rats go to various they've uh, and, and all sorts of introductions, but I think one of the things is that fungal, fungal, 
fungal outbreaks, whether they be on your toes or yeah. in the wider landscape, are incredibly difficult to control. And I personally think uh, in both cases, there's probably not a lot they can do. New Zealand is well in advance of many countries when it comes to biocontrol, mm. and this has happened. I don't think there's a viable option for, um, because you'd have to find a, some kind of biocontrol for Amanita muscaria. Mm. That may be possible. In the case of the Phytophthora, Phytophthora are amazing organisms. I love them. They're my PhD subject, but they are immensely adaptable. We are seeing novel speciation of Phytophthora all over the world because we are moving soils, we are moving biota around, we're mm. putting new populations of Phytophthora next to each other, and they are hybridizing. So quite a few of these new Phytophthora species, that have, and, have, and I'm a little bit out of date on the research on this, have evolved through relatively recent hybridization events, almost certainly driven by human activity. Um, biocontrol is massively important, but we know that, you know, biocontrol only gets you so far. So one of the worry, most worrying things globally is uh, the accidental introduction of a South American rust species into Australia and New Zealand, and it's wind dispersed, so you can't stop it in pretty much the same way as um, uh, ash dieback in this country. And this non-native rust is quite likely because of the very, very high level of the Myrtaceae, particularly in Australia, to drive quite significant lineages of Australian tree species, including eucalypts and their relatives, to the brink of extinction. Mm. Yeah, quite, quite frightening. And there's a question from, from Andrew here about do trees have an immune system? Um, yeah. Yes, they do. Um, yes. As I didn't touch on the technicalities of it because I'm I'm a little bit rusty on this, but they have very, very, and all plants have yeah. very complex and sophisticated, um, sometimes physical mechanical protections, i.e. bark. Bark is their first line of defense in many cases, their epidermis, but they have very complex biochemical reactions to prevent pathogens getting in on them. Yeah, and and we had a, a a talk with actually the first talk of this series was was um, Sophie and Camoon who was talking about the immune system. Um, Who's another of, fan of UMICs? Yes, of course, <laughs> yeah, um, here, Here's here's a question from one of our our, our regular attendees. Evening, Sue. Um, how can you be sure? That the fungus you are introducing to control Himalayan balsam is safe? The very good question often comes up in general around questions around biocontrol as a whole. Biocontrol has got a bad rap because people think it means the cane toad fiasco of Australia, which was not biocontrol, that was stupidity, releasing a toad into the environment and just watching it eat mm. everything. In general, first thing is that puccinias, the rusts, are very, the vast majority of them are very, very host specific. It's just part of their evolutionary gamut as a group of fungal organisms. So there's the underlying biology. When you look for a potential target biocontrol organism, you don't go for something that's polyphagous, that eats lots and lots of different types of things. That's asking for trouble. So you pick something that's already very, very fussy in where it comes from which is the Puccinia. Then it has gone through extremely extensive, over quite a few years, testing exercises in laboratories, both in Petri dishes and then with living plants across relatives of Impatiens um, and other less closely related things, crop plants and the whole range of things. So there's quite a few steps in the protocol to manage risk and assess it. So if you go to the CABI website, CABI Bioscience have got a very, very good um, set of pages explaining how biocontrol, if it's done properly, the, mis mis the risks are very, very low. Um, and also when you counterbalance it with the risks of not doing something, we know that impatience is causing ecological damage on quite a major scale. In fact, it's increasingly shown to be causing damage to human well-being as well. So Yes, there are risks, but they are counterbalanced by many, many steps in between, or we aim to. 
We don't just go, oh, yeah, there's a fungus. Not, hey! Yeah. The, 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 there are more questions coming in than I think we could actually put to you at the moment. So um, bear with me if I try and yeah, get through I'm as many fine, don't you worry. It's, it's, it's okay. you too, I know. Um, uh, there's a comment here that's fascinating talk. And then a question, in your experience, are more pathogens mutating to a wider <laughs> host range? Oh, oh. oh now there's a that again possibly coming back to the climate change question you, this is something where you know physiologically stressed environments physiologically stressed organisms plants and animals that gives gaps for adaptation in evolution in pathogens whether it they be virus bacteria or fungi um it probably needs more careful thought and consideration and work wise. But I would not be surprised. You know, stressed environments and ecosystems, diseases get in. Yeah. Which sort of relates to another question that's come up. If we have more summers like the last one and drought for months, can we expect, for instance, honey fungus to become more troublesome in gardens? I would say yes. Anecdotally, myself and other people who botanise and go fungal foraging in the London area in the southeast of England are seeing um, quite a few trees going down at the end of you know, or the end of the spring following very hot weather. I've got a load of mature but not fully mature cherry trees and hawthorns, and two of the hawthorns, which normally are pretty tough and live a long time if everything's right just drop dead like that and then the honey fungus turned at the bottom ordinarily i wouldn't have expected that to happen so combinations of heat island impacts drought through climate change heat stress from climate change poor management of streets in the infrastructure of urban areas all will lead to greater disease events i'm sure of it and here's a question that goes back to phytophthora um and and how they get into their host is it via the stomata varies oh that's a wonderful question so phytophthora are actually part of a suite of kind of adaptations in oomycetes some will such as pythiums their relatives will penetrate root systems and get into seed gates and stuff like that others will penetrate damaged wood trunks and stuff so in the case of cowrie dieback a one major way that they're, they're getting into cowrie, and wasn't where there's some hope, is through non-native pigs scratching the tree trunks and the base of the roots and then getting in through the damage. Phytophthora infestans and some of its relatives, one of the more specialised ones of the, these lineages, and they move through rain splash onto foliage, but they can also avoid root systems. So phyto Phytophthora is really good. It can do rain splash growing on foliage, but it can also attack the root system. They're ninjas. Yeah. And here's here's a here's a quite um, well, it's a question from somebody you 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 will hopefully remember, Jacqueline, um, you and McMaster. Um, oh yes, yes. And hi, Mark. Delightful. You, you assisted me greatly during or oh, is this Jacqueline St Quentin but yes. um you assisted me ah, great, fragmidium. Great, hello <laughs> greatly during my research years at Kew any news on the specific fungal pathogen for biocontrol of R. Nivius the subject so, yes, of my PhD Rubius. yeah that was Rubius Nivius hello Jacqueline I haven't seen you for a while hopefully run into each other at the Linsock again at some point no I don't know what the latest news on it because um, Rubus nivius is relative one of our brambles, but it's a invasive species in the tropics. is particularly problematic in the Galapagos, where Jacqueline was interested in it. I don't keep, frankly, abreast on a day-to-day -day basis with what's happening with Rubus nivius at the moment. I don't know. Hopefully, they'll be moving forward with it. Right. I'm going to move. I, I think we'll stop taking questions now. Thank you, everyone. There's so much interest. I'll try and finish off as, as many as I can before quarter past eight. Um, what are examples of successful biocontrol projects? Uh -huh. There are a lot. Again, the CABI website gives some really good ones. Um, 
So ones that have been incredibly successful in um, the tropics, there's a, oh, my brain's gone blank all of a sudden, trying to remember ones. Uh, people at Cabby are going, Mark, come on, you do better. <laughs> there are a really good list, particularly there's a non-native myconia plant, which is causing serious damage. And there's some very good um, pathogen control with that. Um, you could argue, even though it wasn't really thought through in the way initially, that actually the cochineal beetle um, controlling um, a ficus, um, a puntia ficus indicus in Australia is a good example. There are ones, they temporarily slipped my mind, but the CABI website's got some very, very good information. They did a critical yeah. study of the number of biocontrol attempts, and they looked at about a thousand studies um, versus ones that failed and ones where non-target activities, they got some very good data on them. Thank you. Um, does the balsam puxinia have an alternative host? I guess no. It, yeah. No. So this is one that doesn't. It doesn't have. So some puxinias have got really real. I mean, they still got pretty complicated. It's got a really complicated life cycle. Puxinia comorovii, but it doesn't have an alternate host. It is all on um, on the on the plant itself. Yeah, but some do have this this two host thing. Hence the name. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, they had to specifically give it a scientific name because it hadn't been named as part of the approval protocols. They found the rust, realised it was different, only lived on Himalayan balsam. Then they had to publish the scientific name so it could go into the legislative mm -hmm. framework and the approval framework. It has taken years. <laughs> a lot of very thorough science has gone into it. It's a very, very interesting one to look up. Mm -hmm. And then again, talking of biocontrol, are there examples you know where fungi attack other pathogenic fungi? Oh, ah, uh, <laughs> yes. Well, fung fungus on fungus and um, sort of murderous action is pretty common. Um, not a pathogenic relationship. One of the ones I, I really love is so many of you might be familiar with earth balls growing in woodlands, they're like little puff balls. Mm -hmm. They're actually relatives of the boletes, um, but they get parasitized by a parasitic bolete called Pseudoboletus parasiticus. Mm. And Pseudoboletus parasiticus actually invades the fruiting body of one species of earth ball, eats all the spores on the inside, scoffs it all out, and then produces its own fungus fruiting body on top. So there is a lot of sort of interactions between fungi as well of these natures yeah that's a beauty that's that was the one that came to my mind immediately I love it. having Such seen, cool seen them yeah yes yeah. yeah it's a great thing to see um and now i i think this is the the great question that uh, i think will will make money for a lot of people if they can do it is there any chance we can start a truffle industry in this country uh, it's already developing. It's already developing. So there are quite a few people. Truffles are um, they're ascomycetes. They're not in the big group, which are the basidiomycetes of the kingdom fungi. Um, and they are they've been quite amenable to cultures. So there are various people are inoculating them onto hazel. You can actually buy hazel saplings that have been inoculated in the truffles. Um, so I know some actually some fairly large scale enterprises in the chalky soils of southern England are considering this kind of project to integrate it with other forms of kind of, you know, diverse farming kind of approaches. Thank you. And then there, the, 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 there is a final question from from Ziggy, who made the initial comment. I'm not sure whether this is Ziggy Stardust or, or who, but um, it. it he or she is is saying, um, do fungi react to music like trees and plants? Um, I don't know. And it's interesting. I mean, some months ago, I was on um, the Infinite Monkey Cage with Susan Simard, who's fundamental in the Wood Wide Web concepts and how society responds to it. And we, made, we were talking about how, you know, things that we now 
know or are beginning to appreciate about plant communications, plant responses and stuff, 30 years ago, you'd have probably rolled your eyes and laughed. Ideas such as, you know, potential, you know, concepts of, not concepts, but recognition of kinship mechanisms within plants, for example, and other sensory responses, we would have probably laughed at 30, 40 years ago. Um, maybe, maybe, but I'm not sure it would possibly be in the same way that we respond to music. Mm. Um, who knows? Who knows? Um, uh, yeah, a way to go on that one. I think that's yeah. the thing is, you know, the, the world of biology and natural history and plants and fungi, we're still only beginning to understand these things. Yes, absolutely. And what a great point to end this um, lecture series on. There's so much still to be found out in this wonderful biological world in which we live and hopefully for many, mm. many, many years to come. So yeah. um, thank you, Mark, for the final lecture. And I hope everyone has enjoyed these um, wonderful series of, ele of, 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 of lectures. And you'll join us for the winter lectures, which start um, in the middle of January. And um, we'll hope to see you then. And in the meantime, thanks again, Mark. My pleasure. And, um, good, good, see luck. You. good luck with all your for current forensic projects down in the West Country. Thank you. Okay. Take good care. Night. Bye. Good night, Bye. everybody.